Hi, I'm Danny Lee. I directed and produced Who is Stan Smith? I'm also the founder of BIPOC production company Calico. Welcome to Factual America. I'm your host, Matthew Sherwood. Each week, I watch a hit documentary and then talk with the filmmakers and their subjects. This week, it is my pleasure to welcome Danny Lee, the award-winning director of Who is Stan Smith? The film is the story of a tennis icon now better known for the shoe he endorsed beginning in the early 1970s. But as Danny points out, Stan Smith's legacy is about something far greater than tennis or fashion. Danny Lee, welcome to Factual America. How are things with you? Everything's well. I, uh, yeah, this morning I got my kids to school on time. That's so an a good accomplishment. Day. Excellent. It is. I, 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 I hear where you're coming from. Um, and a big, uh, well, so thanks again for coming onto the, uh, onto the podcast. And also congratulations on uh, completing your film. And I gather uh, it's, uh, who is Stan Smith? Is it premiering at Doc NYC? Is that right? It is premiering at Doc NYC, uh, November 9th. We're excited because Stan's story has been sort of sitting in gestation forever, right? Like, mm. it's not often you get to tell someone's story while they're still alive, right? That's that's yeah. iconic and legendary. Yeah. Yeah. Stan is this elder statesman in tennis yeah. who's done so much for the sport, but often, you know, people know him for the tennis shoe, right? right. right. It's actually the original tennis shoe. It's funny when people call shoes tennis shoes when they're really not. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but it's kind of the original tennis shoe, if you will. Mm. Well, so Rod, Rod Lavers was, to be specific. But anyway, so you've answered that question about who you know the the film, the title of the film, who is Stan Smith. You've you've you know we've answered that question. Uh, uh, the iconic uh, tennis star and an endorser of a, an iconic shoe. Um, but as we often ask our guests, I mean. I'll ask that question again, who is Stan Smith? But in this case, what is what is Stan Smith the movie? What is it about? Maybe it's a, give us a synopsis, because it's more than just about Stan Smith, the tennis player. For sure. Um, you know, in, in sort of excavating and doing research on Stan, right, like I, like most other people, instantly thought about the shoe. And the shoe, it, like even through high school and everything, it always sort of was just there. And it's always this sort of premium thing that everyone aspired to have. Um, so who is Stan Smith is essentially the thesis of the film. Who is the man behind this shoe that we've all heard of, right? And initially, I went into it thinking it might be a sports biopic of a superstar athlete who went on to achieve greatness, right? But as we went through this, this process, it became this unexpected journey for from late tennis bloomer to a collegiate superstar mm. to Wimbledon champion and number one in the world to this unexpected fashion icon and humanitarian. Um, for me, the, the, the story is really very much about this athlete who is obsessed with being the best and sort of stumbled upon and discovered his own humanity through the process. Mm. Mm. Wow. Uh, and so how did you, was this your idea? Um, how did you become involved? Uh, I was fortunate enough. Um, I had a meeting with Spring Hill, the Spring Hill Company, which is LeBron James and Maverick Carter's company. That's right. With these two executives named Phil Byron and Camille Marachi, who are incredible partners. And they were talking to me about another project. And it didn't feel right for me just because it was a long, it was like a two season sort of commitment. Mm -hmm. And, um, and but it was great creative and i just at the time i couldn't commit to that but we we hit it off and they were saying well what about these two projects we have one about boxing that's for a specific place that's already picked up and then we have this other one that we want to deficit finance i'm like what's the other one <clears throat> and they're like stan smith and my eyes lit up um this coincided with me just having picked up tennis through the pandemic i'd never played tennis before and i started playing and the joy you get on walking on a court. So, like, it just felt serendipitous. It felt like it was just right. And uh, I leaped to it and I said, excuse my language, I said, fuck yes, I'm doing that. <laughs> well, thank goodness you did. And you and I both, I mean, I, I, I did play a little bit as a kid, but I hadn't picked up a racket in years. And, yes, I, I 
started playing tennis during the pandemic. Uh, yeah. Had a, had a court just around the corner. So, uh, and it just brought a lot of uh, that. And your film has brought back a lot of a lot of great memories of an interest. A, a, I find a very entertaining and compelling era of of tennis. Um, For sure. And maybe you can tell us. So maybe let, on that note, I mean. Let's go back to Stan Smith, the tennis player. I mean, uh, as you say, most people just only know him really for the shoes. But he's he. How big a deal was he? Maybe you know. I think a lot of people don't really realize that he was he was the real deal. He was the real deal. Um, you know, his story is interesting because it traverses this the most formative inflection point in tennis, right? right. The the I guess before the open era. And I won't get into this really complicated explanation, but you probably don't want that either. But (laughs) basically at the time, Stan was, uh, you know, he was this wonder kind, you know, he started late, there was all this buzz about him and he became the number one player in the world. He was just dominant. He was a tall guy, he was big and he really, he was a power player. And, you know, at the time, um, he was sort of the leading American player as well, next to Arthur Ashe, mm-hmm. who they were really close friends. And um, but what really made you know Stan stand out, and you'll see in the film, is the stuff he did off the court. Um, you know, there was he won Wimbledon in '72. The year mm-hmm. after, most champions defend their crown. It's very rare that you can win again, and he boycotted Wimbledon to sort of unionize tennis. And so what he did for the sport, what he did for people in general, really, again, made him stand out. So, you know, I didn't live in 1970. I wasn't born then or 1972. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, from all of our firsthand accounts of people that were there and his friends and family, of course, he was a huge deal. And that's why Adidas, Mm -hmm. a German company, Right. came to him to take over this shoe. Mm. Mm. I mean, back to the point where, about what he meant for tennis. I mean, I, in, the, in the film, you've got, uh, I mean, John Macro is not of the habit of giving out compliments to people. And uh, I think he, uh, begrudgingly, but says uh, about other things. But on this, he certainly said no player, I believe, is something to the effect of no player has done more for the game than than what Stan Smith did by by actually being in that ATP boycott of, uh, of the 73 Wimbledon. Um, so it's quite, I mean, I guess what, I, I mean, what I took away from it is a reminder that, um, you know, tennis went from being this supposedly kind of amateurish, very uh, upper class kind of sport. And, you know, the changes that are all happening in your film, touches on a lot of things that were going on in the 60s and, and 70s and, and even be obviously up to the current day but uh just you know um what they did to the sport and brought it to into the modern era basically and uh and he and he made sacrifices because he you know we all tend to track how many singles you know grand slams players have won and he probably could have won of a good number more if he hadn't you know who knows you know, with yeah, with he did win the, the you know, he won a bunch of doubles, uh, right, grand slams. Um, but yeah, he, you know, I'd like to think, and I think anyone can attest that he laid the foundation for modern tennis, yeah. right? Um, especially what he did with the ATP and, of course, Rod Laver and everyone else involved. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, he, I think, proves, I think, the what comes out of what we. I guess the moral of the tale is it's not necessarily all about winning, right? It's like mm. the the longer lasting impacts you can have on humanity. And as maybe, uh, I don't want to sound too earnest, but like once you meet the man, he is, uh, he's just a wonderful human being. And I think he's a testament of what the, 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 the possibilities of, of what we can all do. Yeah. We try to do good. Well, I think that's, I mean, you know, your film tracks this incredible story arc that is his life. Um, and, you know, yes, and there's obviously the, the, as you mentioned, the shoes and Adidas, or as they say over here, Adidas were, uh, you know, keen to, to uh, you know, get, you know, 
they wanted to break into the U.S. and they signed him on. But it's it's as you've said, it's 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 really his legacy is about so much more. Um, and as you touch on the film, the the friendship and with Arthur Ashe, and again, I it's hard to if, if for someone my age, it's hard to maybe appreciate this. But there's probably a lot of people out there who don't even really know who Arthur Ashe is. But uh, that's for sure. Uh, but what he meant for the game and for beyond the game. And they both were both men of who valued f- friends and family, certainly. Yeah. Um, right. And I think is, is what you were saying about what we can do for, you know, I think is even at the end, not to spoil alert, but you've got people like, you know, r- rappers from Run DMC and other places saying that, you know, it's it's the fact that he is this everyman, unassuming, very humble person that makes him into this sort of superhero of sorts, isn't it? Right. Yeah. No, I think that's fair. And it's we. I don't know if this is coincidental, but it sort of is, runs parallel with the shoe, right? Like the shoe is somewhat. Yeah. It looks beautiful, but it's unassuming. It hasn't changed much over the years, and it seems like everyone can wear them. It's unisex. Um, and it, it just kind of represents him in many ways, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And I yeah. love what DMC sa- says at the end, which I won't spoil, but he kind of summarizes it perfectly. Yeah, yeah. And I think another thing that illustrates, because the thing I didn't know anything of, I mean, I, not that I'm a know that much about Stan Smith, but the one thing I was supposed, I was completely unaware of, and I think that what illustrates all this is this whole story with uh, maybe we won't give away too much, but with. Uh, uh, Mark Mathabene, you know, that's that's an incredible story. I mean, you know, this South African author who, to a large part, owes his uh, his uh, life and success and what he's achieved to people like Stan Smith and, and Arthur Ashe as well. But um, right. it's not like Stan goes around um, trumpeting this, and I'm sure there's probably more stories like this that you probably were tempted to put in the film but you only have a uh, only have 90 minutes you only have 90 minutes right um you know stan with mark mathabani who is this rising mm-hmm. south african tennis player yeah. uh stan and him you know there there's this chance encounter and stan probably saw something in mark he might have had you know we we talked about this there may have been some guilt he talks about this in the film of mm. feeling like he didn't support Arthur enough in certain causes at the time, yeah. not because he didn't agree with the causes, but you know, when you're raising a huge family, you don't have in- infinite time. Right. And so maybe Mark represented a bit of Stan's ability to redeem that feeling mm. he may have had. Um, but he'll, he can speak to that himself, but it, it was an unexpected story. I, I did not expect that at all, at all. And I think Stan's story was in, was interesting and challenging as a filmmaker because there's not a lot of internal drama and conflict, right? right? Like he didn't have substance abuse issues. He didn't experience a lot of death, except for, of yeah. course, Arthur. Right. Um, so it was sort of trying to identify where all out of the tension in the story laid. Yeah. And so early on, you know, we and my team of producers – Shout out to Rebecca Halpern and Blake Bruns, who were very uh, obviously contribute. They, they helped immensely. Um, it was obvious that we had to kind of take this inside outside world approach where, you know, because like Stan, he's nothing like Forrest Gump, but in many ways, like Forrest Gump yeah. found himself in the middle of these like historical events. Right, right. Right. And Stan in very similar ways did too. He's playing in the middle of the Vietnam war. He's playing during the height of apartheid in South Africa. He's playing during this huge, this moment in tennis where it went open. And so all these different things. And so it felt like, why would we ignore sort of the, the context of history? Let's lean into it. And that it informed the, the drama of every moment. Right. So, that was a challenge, though. I mean, you know, the the bulletin board of index cards moved right. every few days. We're like, how does this? And there were a lot of stuff that got, lay, got left on the on the cutting room floor. Like, there's an amazing moment that's called Battle of Bucharest, where Stan goes into um, 
Bucharest, which was behind the Soviet curtain, right? right. <clears throat> During the height of the Cold War, and he's playing Nastasi. And, um, you, you know, there are people throwing stuff at him, and they're, you know, like the Yankees are in town. And yeah. and I wanted so bad to include it because it's such a memorable scene, and we still have the, the edit. Yeah. But, you know, you have to kill darlings. Yeah. That's how yeah. it goes. All right. Well, hold hold that thought. We're going to give our listeners an early break here. So we'll be right back with uh, Danny Lee, the award-winning director and and writer as well. Is that uh, writer and producer? Um, of writer and who, producer. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, who is Stan Smith? Uh, premiering at Doc NYC on November 9th. and we'll ask Danny uh, after the break uh, where or if he does know where other you might be able to see this if you can't make it to Doc NYC. You're listening to Factual America. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at Alamo Pictures to keep up to date with new releases or upcoming shows. Check out the show notes to learn more about the program, our guests, and the team behind the production. Now back to Factual America. Welcome back to Factual America. I'm here with Danny Lee, the director of Who is Stan Smith, premiering at Doc NYC on November 9th. Uh, you were talking. We were talking about stuff that you had to leave on the cutting room floor. You, uh, by the way, did you try to interview Nastasi? Because that would have been interesting. Yeah, we were. Oh God, it would have. I, I spoke to him. Uh, we were texting, and then we started looking. We we obviously did a deeper dive into any possible scandals, and he had said some really wrong stuff. Yeah. And we were like, "There's no way we're going to put this guy, give him a platform." So okay, yeah. Yeah, okay. I mean, he would have made sense. He would have. He was the villain in the film. Yeah. yeah. However, again, we, we can't condone some of the stuff he said. Okay. Um, because uh, yeah, well, he was a villain in real back. <laughs> he didn't even have to make him a villain. He was. I, I'm old enough to remember him as a as as a tennis player, and uh, yeah, I think uh, he was a villain then as well. Um, but he, uh, like he felt like a character out of Superman from the '80s, like just that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, I mean, you were saying, how you know, I mean, yes, I guess for some people, D- D- uh, Stan Smith, you know, as you say, there's not a lot of uh, uh, Storm and Drang. I mean, he's like, uh, there's, he's this great guy and everyone loves him and uh, uh, you've leaned into the history element of it to, to, um, to, to bring some of that... Uh, that uh, conflict to life, but did he? I mean, how was he? As a, 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 it strikes me, would he have been? Was he reticent about making a film about his life? It seems to me he might have said, "Well, you know, he's a, as you we know, he's a humble and a, unassuming fella." Yeah, no, it was exactly that. Um, and by the way, just because a story doesn't have a, a ton of conflict and tension, yeah. who says we can't have a feel good movie? Like that's that. That was actually my yeah. pitch. I want yeah. to make people feel good and really feel. And I think we've achieved a, a very emotive film. Um, uh, he, he at first, he, you know, he had a book that preceded this called Some People Think I'm a Shoe, which right. is very an appropriate title. <laughs> and so I think he was sort of warming up to the idea, right? That book came out, I believe, in 2019. And so, but this, you know, the book is very thin on actual story it's more of like an oral history of people sort of conjecture on his on a sneaker yeah um he was you know when we met i think he he just told me he's like does anyone care why would anyone care and that just struck me i'm like stan people care like you are stan smith and it is not, it's not a facade. Like the man is just incredibly humble. Like anyone can walk, he'll spend 30 minutes speaking to a stranger mm-hmm. and it's totally authentic. And I think he represents a sort of personality almost of a bygone era, right? Mm-hmm. It's the true gentleman who is patient and really interested in what you have to say. And that seems to be, that seems to be a surprise these days of the celebrities like that. Yeah. I mean, in a different way, but we've, we had the uh, filmmaker son who did the uh, recent Nolan Ryan doc and kind of reminds, you know, of similar, similar generation, similar, uh, 
Maybe, yeah. maybe because they're, I, I don't know, is Stan Smith on, uh, does he have a smartphone? Maybe he's not as distracted as so many of us are, you know? <laughs> he does. He does. Yeah. <laughs> so. the, te- the text is really big. <laughs> <laughs> well, he is, he's what, in his late, late seventies now, but, uh, um, this strikes me that it was also, as you said, as a feel good film and, and feel good films, you say, you know, I'm, I, well, I, I don't think it does, but I imagine with some people who say if something's a feel good film that might strike them as being, uh, I don't know, fluffy or soft, but it's anything, but I found it very, uh, I found it very emotive is the word you use. And I thought that was an excellent way of describing it. And I found it quite, there's some very poignant and very emotional, um, scenes, uh, maybe subtly so, but just the. It, 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 I think that part of Stan comes certainly comes out in the film, uh, but it's, it strikes me this is a this is a really fun film to make. It was fun um, and feel good. You're right. The maybe maybe that terminology isn't perfect. I think more of like it's a sensory film, right? It's mm. it's meant to make you feel the emotions and relate to certain things, and um, you know it's not. Well, I, I would leave it at that. Um, making the film was incredibly fun, right? Yeah. I mean, meeting Stan, meeting his family, meeting everyone. Donald Dell is a riot. Donald yeah. Dell, if you don't know, he's Stan's agent. He was Michael Jordan's original agent who got right. My, Michael Jordan his first two Nike deals. He is, the, he is a kingpin. He is the originator of sports endorsements. You, you know, so just kind of immersing myself in that universe was incredibly fun. Shooting during a pandemic is never easy. Mm. Getting your nose, getting your brain stabbed every two days and yeah. on pins and needles, hoping that no one catches it, which no one did the whole time. Yeah. Um, but it was really fun. It was really gratifying yeah. to make it. It was grueling for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Cause we were, we were on a tight schedule. Yeah. Yeah, but you've got you've got cool archive in there. You've got uh, you know some stuff. I, I mean, someone's definitely done their job because you've even gotten. I mean, I guess it's not to be unexpected, but you got some nice archival stuff that shows, uh, you know, in in Stan in his early days and his wife and you know and and in a lot of and like you said, it's not just Stan. You've got these tennis stars uh, who are still around who are able to. To, to talk about, uh, I mean, I guess you could have gotten Laver on there. I guess you could have gotten some others, but I mean, it's it's still it's uh, it's 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 quite amazing, and it to because uh, that that window is closing, obviously. So it's uh, it um, I don't know. I think it's just a really uh, it's a it's an interesting era, and uh, and it's not just a sixties, seventies, eighties pick. I mean, it it covers everything. So, but. Uh, um, no, it's a very, uh, um, it's, I, I, you know, it's fun. It's fun, and yet um, it's uh, also very, uh, uh, like you said, I think it, it's, it's, it does make you think, and I think you, not again, not to have a spoiler, but I think that's what it all gets to at the end of the film, isn't it? As, as, we've, as you've mentioned more than once already, that it's, at least what Stan would probably want us to talk about is that it's not him as a tennis player. It's not him as a, as someone who people think is a shoe, but is, uh, well, I'll say it. He, he, you know, it's his legacy is going to be something bigger and different than tennis and fashion. Right. Right. It's not all about the wins on the board people. It's, it's about sort of the impact you have and, trying to make it a better place because let's face it like every day in the news yeah it's rough it's rough (laughs) and he's very quiet about it but he does mention you know he's a man of faith right so he's that's something that's also informed him his um his his life and how he's how he's lived it so absolutely yeah yeah well i mean uh Thanks again for uh, for uh, for making this film. I think it's uh, really enjoyed it. Are you where, where? I mean, you're in the very early days, so you're getting a premiere at Doc NYC. Are you where else is it going to be showing? Do you know yet? We don't know. I mean, that's uh, it premieres there, and from there it'll be on some streamer TBD. There's obviously interest from a variety of parties, but uh, 
it's a little bit over my head at the moment. So I let the folks that do the selling uh, take care right. of that. Yeah. Yeah. And so you've got both a uh, uh, a scripted and a doc background, uh, quite interesting right. and varied. But uh, what's uh, I mean, it's, it's not your first one that has a shoe theme, is it? I mean, I think you did. You, uh, but uh, you've got a few shoes. You, do you have a shoe fetish? I don't know. I, <laughs> uh, yeah, I was I was terrified you would ask that. Um, it's weird. I don't know why that has happened. Maybe one led to another that led to another, and it's all very unintentional. I don't have a crazy shoe collection. Yeah. Um, I do have certain ones that I, I really covet because they represent art to me and they represent their time capsules, right? right. They represent right. an era. Right. And I think that's what sneakers are all about. It's about the art. It's about the history. It's about the culture. Mm. Um, yeah, I happen to do a few sneaker documentaries. One was called 30 for 30 on the shoe store. Uh, one was a 30 for 30 on this shoe store called Friedman Shoes that specialized in mm. size 12 and up for big guys who needed right fancy shoes and it was like the place to go in atlanta in the 80s and 90s we had shack in it um and it would but it's really at the end of the day it's about it's a story about a family business that's struggling to survive mm -hmm. at the dawn of e-commerce right? right um i did a couple nike documentaries one about the air max sneaker another one about the dunk sneaker right and the dunk sneaker particularly it was this like again this this sneaker that united a bunch of different subcultures. And that's what made me really interested in it because that's what I, as you can see, like mm -hmm. I've grown up in many different subcultures from hip hop, graffiti, skateboarding, et cetera. And um, for me, that's what always what's make it, what makes it interesting is how do I find the humanity and the culture and the story? So I don't, I'm not a quote unquote sneaker head. I'm not a huge sneaker enthusiast. I like sneakers. Uh, but I, I got a mortgage. I got mortgages to pay. I'm not wasting my money like that. Nor is my closet big enough. No, no, it's. Uh, don't worry about it. I wasn't trying to, and you don't have to apologize. Uh, but I think, uh, <laughs> no, funny. just right. We, you know, it is. It was inter it's an interesting one. If you're scan scanning the uh, IMDb profile and the and the like, <laughs> you know. Um, but we've had. I mean, we uh, there was one that premiered at uh, South by a few years ago. That was the um, one about a British. Uh, based doc actually on on michael jordan a man and his you know and, and air jordans and you know there's a lot of it's interesting i think in in the stan smith film as well like you said these different subcultures that i hadn't quite really i mean yes i remember the uh adidas song by uh, run dmc but i hadn't put that together with stan smith's mm -hmm. right you know and i hadn't mm -hmm. and you've got the beastie boys and you've got now and you've got Pharrell williams in there and you've got some of this other stuff you know the things that have happened uh recently uh um and uh you know i'm all I'm not as bad as Stan. I, I know it's Jay Z and not Jay's, but uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, I mean, it's 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 an interest. It is interesting, uh, and it is an yeah, interesting like, phenomenon. Shoes are inanimate objects. It feels materialistic, but that's not what it's about. I guess right. It's about things. Yeah. It's a commonality you have with someone. It's a shared experience or whatever. We all remember. I remember growing up and having my Nike Delta Forces and right. just right. beating those up to death. Um, so yeah, I, shoes are just shoes. I think it's what's behind the shoe and it's really about how you relate to people. So, so you're probably going to, since I've now asked this, you're probably going to try to avoid doing another shoe, uh, related doc, but, uh, or no, keep it going. It's, you're doing well with it, no. but, uh, um, but what's, what do yeah. you have in the, what's on the cards for you after, uh, uh, after, uh, who is Stan Smith? Not a shoe documentary, that's for sure. Um, unless, you know, it's funny, we were considering one, another one with Nike that ultimately didn't pan out, but probably for the best because um, I've been making a strong transition in the scripted, okay. right? So my next, the, my next project is a pro, I can't say too much about it because it's not announced yet, but it's mm. a true story that's a crime drama that takes place in the world of, uh, the Chinese underworld in Manhattan's Chinatown in mm -hmm. the world of the triads, the Tongs, the street gangs. Nina Yang Bon Jovi, who produced Fruitvale Station, mm -hmm. Dope, Sorry to Bother You, etc. Um, she's producing it 
She's an incredible producer with great taste. Mm -hmm. And so my head's down has my head has been down in that, which um, we should be making hopefully 2023. Okay. Um, I'm also in the midst of directing two music feature docs. One is for HBO. Okay. The other is for TBD. They're both, fairly iconic music artist and music's always been my number one, you know, mm. it's, it's always been something I grew up with. And so really excited about those because they're Excellent. very much follow docs too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well. well, congratulations. I mean, is there a particular reason why you're, you, I mean, you're also, what is it about, I mean, cause you're not the, you know, some people do this, so you're moving to scripted. I mean, it, t it tends to be this dichotomy. People either do docs or they do scripted, and they don't tend to, to mix. But uh, what's what's moving you in that direction? I don't think I'm moving in that direction. I think I'm expanding my, opening my aperture. Yeah. Terrible pun. But um, <laughs> it, it really am. I mean, like most documentarians, we started out wanting to write a script and all that. And I actually already directed a feature for Lionsgate a while ago. It was okay. um, a few years ago. It was a comedy. It wasn't exactly my sort of fair, but it was a good experience in getting my hands dirty in a scripted film and understanding that process. But I've always been both. And I don't, yeah. and it is a little frustrating, I think, for a lot of documentarians when they get pigeonholed as only right. being able to do one thing. Whereas a lot of the times, a, a scripted filmmaker can dip into a documentary, put their name on it hire a bunch of staff <laughs> and yeah, sort of just yeah. conduct the interviews. Right. And right. fellow documentarians know it's, it's a process. It's mm -hmm. very rigorous and it's, and it's very different from scripted, but at the end of the day, we're all telling a story. Yeah. And um, I think the difference is being able to manage different configurations of crew, being able to really get the emotional core out of your actors. So, I just think I'm doing both and I always will do both. Um, so yeah. So all my fellow documentarians, you know, like don't let anyone tell you you can only do documentaries. Yeah. That's bullshit. Well, and I think, yes, I would have, I, well, I'm not, I'm not a documentarian, but I, I would do, uh, I would hope that that is definitely the, the case that people would do, do expand. I mean, what we see is, I mean, in doing this podcast, I mean, it's not even just about pigeonholed as a documentarian, but you become true crime guy or gal, oh, or you, yeah. you know, you know, or your music, you only do music docs or, you know, I mean, that's not always the case. There's some people who've, um, who were able to run the gamut, but it, it is this, I guess it's just human nature trying to pigeonhole people, but I think in, in any industry, really. But, it's usually uh, the agents. You can blame the agents. Yeah. <laughs> usually <laughs> there's, a, there's a stack of resumes. You're the crime guys. You're the, you know, et cetera. Yeah. But no, I mean, the agents have a very difficult job of like trying to get you your next project, right? But I do think crime is a very specific thing, right? And having relationships with detectives and all that, I, 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 I see that. I, I don't, I think the hardest jump for people to make is, is length of time, right? Being able to tell a story over 90 minutes versus compressing it to half an hour. But at the end of the day, if you're, if you're good, mm. you should be able to tell any story because I, I really do believe you should be exploring stories that you're curious about. If your curiosity is operating at a high yeah. level, then you're, you're in the right place. If you're not curious about something, mm. You're not in the right project. Yeah. And you've done a lot of shorts too. Do you have a, I mean, is that, uh, do you have a preference or is he just kind of what, whatever is necessary to tell the story, whether it's scripted or, or narrative? I mean, or uh, it's a great question. Yeah. It's a great question. I don't, I just don't believe in a pre conceived total running time scripted yeah. or non-scripted doc, like uh, the project that I'm doing with Nina the crime drama originally I was looking at it as a doc mm. and I started getting into research and I'm like, this is an incredible universe yeah. that we should make into a scripted film. And then we should turn this into a TV series, which is all is what yeah. we're talking about now. So I think the story dictates the medium, honestly. Yeah. yeah. And I guess with also with streaming, we're not as beholden as as we were before with 
30, 60, 90, those, those numbers. Yeah. yeah. Great. Yeah. It's amazing. <laughs> it's a great time. And no, it's a great time. Really? Yeah. yeah. Even though, yeah, there's so much out there that like the marketing dollars oftentimes get sucked up by the tent poles, but you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what I was going to say, we were talking earlier and I was going to say, we were, I was admiring your, uh, your office and your, uh, your display behind you. Uh, the, um, Maybe one day, and if we haven't scared you off, I'd love to talk to you, have you back on when you, uh, when those uh, music docs uh, drop, um, and maybe you'll have uh, one. We had one guest who, uh, though he claims it was his wife who did it, but uh, I th- it was his Emmy was you know displayed right there on the shelf uh, behind him. So. Uh, <laughs> I can't uh, blame the guy. I don't. You have can't blame him. Yeah, you, you know. Well, you know, it's 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 only a matter soon. of time, but to soon. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Thanks, Danny, it's Matt. been Appreciate been it. a been a pleasure having you on. Uh, thank you again for uh, for coming onto the podcast, and would love to have you back. And uh, just remind our listeners, we've been talking with Danny Lee, the uh, <laughs> director and producer of Who Is Stan Smith premiering at Doc NYC on November 9th, and be on the lookout for it. I'm sure it will be streaming somewhere near you uh, in the not-too-distant future. Danny, take care. Thanks, Matthew. I also would like to thank those who helped make this podcast possible. A big shout-out to Sam and Joe at Intersound Audio in York, England. Big thanks to Amy Ord, our podcast manager at Alamo Pictures, who ensures we continue getting great guests onto the show and that everything otherwise runs smoothly. Finally, a big thanks to our listeners. Many of you have been with us for four incredible seasons. Please keep sending us feedback and episode ideas, whether it is on YouTube, social media, or directly by email. Please also remember to like us and share us with your friends and family wherever you happen to listen or watch podcasts. This is Factual America, signing off. You've been listening to Factual America. This podcast is produced by Alamo Pictures, specializing in documentaries, television, and shorts about the USA for international audiences. Head on down to the show notes for more information about today's episode, our guests, and the team behind the podcast. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Alamo Pictures. Be the first to hear about new productions, festivals showing our films, and to connect with our team. Our homepage is alamopictures.co.uk.